uh, in better investigations, victim advocacy, and in prosecution moving forward. So with me here today, uh, and who will be speaking, I have uh, St. Paul uh, Chief Todd Axtell, St. Paul and Ramsey County Public Health Director Ann Berry, uh, Terry McLaughlin, who is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, otherwise known as MinCASA, and our Ramsey County Board Chair, uh, Jim McDonough. Also, uh, here in support, there are so many people here, and I hope I don't miss anybody, but we have uh, representatives here from uh, Sheriff Jack Sarir's office, uh, Booker Hodges and Tina Kill are here, um, and our new Brighton uh, Public Safety Director, the Chief, Tony Patsnick, is here. Um, and we also have uh, Dave Quam uh, representing uh, this, uh, the Maplewood Police Department, and I'm trying to think of uh, other people that uh, are in law enforcement, but I think I got most of them. Um, also, too, um, uh, we got a call uh, this morning from Senator Tina Smith's office. She really wanted to be a part of this and read the article this morning, and we'll be providing a letter of uh, support for the work that's happening here today in Ramsey County. And also, uh, we got a really nice letter from uh, Representative Betty McCollum's office, and it was just a really heartfelt note. And um, uh, and a representative of her staff is here today uh, as well. And of course, uh, my good friend, Commissioner Rafael Ortega is here with me too. And then also too, as I look out into this audience, I see uh, the people who do this work uh, day in and day out, the people on the front lines from public health, uh, our, say, uh, our SANE nurse uh, uh, and, and, the, and Jim Falkowski who is leading uh, the investigations in St. Paul. And so it's just really wanted from the bottom of my heart to say thank you for the work that we, uh, uh, you do. And uh, it's just really great uh, for all of us to be here today to support it because we're, we're going to do uh, so much better. Um, so in April of 2016, uh, literally about two years ago, uh, we in Ramsey County, uh, and when I say we, I'm talking about law enforcement, I'm talking about prosecution, I'm talking about public health, our county commissioners, our elected officials, uh, took a public stand to commit to improve our community's response to sexual assaults in launching our Start by Believing campaign to change our culture so that victims and survivors feel more empowered to report their abuse. abuse. We all know somebody, I think, um, who has at one point in their life been a victim of a sexual assault or some sort of sex abuse. And oftentimes, if you, I mean, if you speak with them and get to know um, their journey from being a victim to a survivor, oftentimes you will learn that victims feel oftentimes ashamed, embarrassed, they might blame themselves, they may worry about the loss of friendships, uh, professional consequences, and too often they feel that they might not be believed. And so for the past two years, in a very intentional way, we have embarked on a campaign to begin to change all of that. We have developed a public education and engagement campaign involving public health and law enforcement. I really want to send some kudos out to the Sheriff's Office from some of the work that they've been doing around education, educating the public. Uh, we've partnered with college campuses and provided trainings all across Ramsey County. Hamlin University is a Start By Believing campus. Concordia University is a Start By Believing campus. The University of St. Thomas, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, Northwestern University in Roseville and Metropolitan State University. And we've also engaged every city council in Ramsey County to have this really important conversation and to pass a supporting resolution. And Jim McDonough, our commissioner, our chair, um, did a lot of that work to reach out to other elected officials across Ramsey County um, and to champion this message that we need to start having this conversation in, in our community. So as we seek to change our culture and bolster community response uh, to support victims, it is also equally important that we have a robust systems response for the victims of rape that is victim-centered and designed to ensure the accountability of perpetrators. With that in mind, the second part of the Start By Believing campaign was to conduct 
a really in-depth, thorough examination of how our system currently responds to sexual assault situations so that we could seek a better path forward to deliver better outcomes for our victims and to ensure victim account or offender accountability. So going into this review, what we knew and what all of us knew, based upon all of the literature and the reports that are out there, that we know that based upon survey data, one in six women will report that at some point in their life that they have been a victim of a sexual assault. One in 33 men, the same thing. And we also knew that no more than 20% of rapes are actually reported to law enforcement. And we also knew that in this community that at least two-thirds of the investigations uh, that are done by our police agencies are never reported or presented to this office for prosecution review. And we also knew, based upon national data, that a very small portion of these cases are actually charged and an even smaller percentage of perpetrators are actually held accountable and convicted of their crimes. These statistics are all true, not only in Ramsey County, but throughout this nation. For the past two years, this office has dedicated an experienced prosecutor to review the practices of criminal justice prof professionals here in Ramsey County. And I want to call out uh, Assistant Ramsey County Attorney Karen Long, who is the author of this report and spent really the past um, two years thinking about and working on gathering all of this data in partnership with all of our law enforcement agencies. And kudos to them for being a part of that process. And also Brielle Bernardi is here from our office, uh, who is our uh, criminal justice analyst who helped uh, pull all of this data together for us. And I just want to thank them for their dedication and uh, their hard work. And so now, through this review, and, and it's now being released today, we have confirmed much of what we had thought was happening here in Ramsey County, and most importantly, we have identified important areas for improvement and immediate reallocation of resources. There is so much that needs to change, and there's so much in this report that I really want to encourage all of you to take the time to review it, to think about it, and I think that when the community reads the report and looks at the information uh, in this community, I know that the public will say that things need to change. And I know that throughout this country, uh, what we have found in Ramsey County is going to be very, very similar. So in this office, in my office, of the 646 cases that we reviewed, only 29% of them were referred by investigators to, Ramsey, to this office. Prosecutors in this office charged 37% of those cases that were actually presented, meaning that only 11.4% of the total 646 cases in the systems review were eventually charged. Of those cases that were charged, the total conviction rate was 70.3% during that four-year time period. And interestingly, every case that went to trial, uh, they all resulted in a conviction. You might think that that's a good thing, but I think that's not necessarily a good thing. What it means probably is that we really need to be thinking about what kind of cases are we charging and should we be taking some additional chances on other cases, right? And so those are things, important data that we as an office will be reflecting on. Um, in addition, on the investigative side, a significant number of victims and survivors who report to law enforcement have difficulty staying connected with the investigation and eventually drop off. In fact, 26% of our victims who took the step to report to law enforcement put a stop to the investigation at some point. F victims and survivors experience long waiting times, periods with little information about the status of the investigation or the prosecution is communicated back to them. In fact, a very small, small percentage of those victims had uh, victim assistance. 
all of that needs to change. And most importantly, and this is the one thing that I want everybody to understand and I want the public to recognize, because nothing will change unless we recognize that we need to invest in these issues. But most importantly, these cases are complex to investigate and prosecute, and many of the law enforcement agencies have difficulty meeting staffing needs to assure these robust investigations. In fact, one of the investigators described uh, their job as drinking out of a fire hose. That needs to change. The workloads of many of these investigators are much, much too high. So today we are prepared to announce that the county is prepared to release necessary funds uh, to fund investigators, uh, more investigators, even if it's outside of this county. It's obvious that the greatest need and the greatest stress on the investigation where the vast majority of these cases are being uh, presented are in the St. Paul Police Department. In addition, through the work of Ann Barry and Commissioner Jim McDonough, we're also announcing that we're immediately <coughs> adding two new advocates so that we can get victim services and advocacy right away when somebody reports to law enforcement. Uh, so with the established baseline that we have from Karen's review and her report and the new investments that we are going to make in this community, uh, I know that we can realize better outcomes for the victims of sexual assault and we will hold more perpetrators accountable. So as we move forward, Truly, the hard work now really begins. As we transform our community and our system's response to rape in our community, we will continue to monitor and measure the progress uh, that we are making across all of our disciplines. And of course, we're gonna continuously provide this information back to the public in a very transparent way because we want to maximize the public engagement and the interest in the years to come. Thank you so much, and now I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend, Chief uh, Todd Axtell, who's right Thank next you. to me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us today. I want to thank County Attorney Choi for your leadership with this initiative. It's just incredible to see what's happening, a room full of community members, professionals, advocates coming together to not talk about everything that's going well. We're talking about what we can do better moving forward. And oftentimes that doesn't happen in leadership and you're seeing some great leadership today and I wanna just really thank you, John, for your leadership in this area. The only way to improve is to ask the questions and embrace the answers. The St. Paul Police Department continues to be stepping up and leading the effort to improve law enforcement's response to sexual assault. And we owe this to our survivors. Other than murder, sexual violence is the most heinous crime. These crimes rob individuals of their psychological, emotional, and physical well-being. It happens entirely too often, and we as a society need to do absolutely more to prevent it by supporting, excuse me, by supporting survivors and holding perpetrators accountable for their terrible actions. What we've learned as a result of this study is that we do need more investigators. We need to expand training across the law enforcement spectrum, and we need to collaborate between law enforcement agencies, and you'll see many of our partnering agencies here today. Last year, our sex crimes investigators each handled 300 cases. That's a lot of cases to handle for these investigators. And these cases require a lot of work. They're incredibly talented, dedicated, caring, and committed. Their training was largely focused on the technical side of the job. We will do better by expanding training to focus more on the emotional side of the job. Law enforcement agencies can do more to share information about offenders, trends, and innovative investigative techniques. The St. Paul Police Department, we're already taking steps to do more. Next month, we will add two sex crimes investigators to with the support of County Attorney Choi and the Ramsey County Board. Earlier this month, I sent a letter to 29 law enforcement agencies inviting them to join the East Metro Sexual Assault Task Force. 
This task force will include improving communications, improving collaboration, identifying trends, developing innovative ways to hold perpetrators accountable, and most importantly, provide more support to survivors of sexual assault. In addition, we are training our sex crimes investigators to focus on supporting survivors, understanding the trauma, investigative best practices, and understanding perpetrators. All investigations, investigators who haven't already done so will take courses on forensic experiential, ex experiential trauma interviewing, which is a two-day course. Currently, four out of the six investigators that we have have already gone through this. Exploring and understanding physical abuser and sexual offenders. It's a one-day course. Four of the six have already gone through this. Trauma-informed victim interview protocols for adult victims of assault. This will be done by the end of 2018. And secondary trauma training, which focuses on child victims, anybody under the age of 17. It's a one-day course by the end of 2018. Each of our investigators will have gone through this training. We've also signed an agreement with Ramsey County SOS that will allow our officers to more quickly connect survivors to advocates because we know this is the foundation to successful outcomes. We will not stop until we're doing everything we possibly can to seek justice for every survivor. This is a watershed moment for law enforcement and our entire community. I believe that we'll look back at this day, this very day, as a significant step in our efforts to fight for every victim, every survivor of sexual assault. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Ann Berry. Thank you. Good morning. If we truly want to address a problem, we really have to understand that problem. So I want to start also by thanking and commending County Attorney Choi for his leadership and for his willingness to dedicate the resources for this sexual assault system review. It's how we get a better understanding of the problems we face. This report helps us get a deeper understanding of the many layers of our structures, our policies, our practices, our systems that we are going to need to address if we want to really see a change that will increase the likelihood that anyone sexually assaulted will report the crime and throughout the process will get the support and service they need to heal and to hold offenders, offenders accountable. We all have lots of work to do. For public health, that means in addition to adding staff to support at, to add staff for support and advocacy, we will now be working directly with the St. Paul Police, as you've already heard, when an arrest is made. That means support and advocacy can start so much sooner. At St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health, we have dual roles in addressing sexual violence in our community through our SOS, Sexual Offense Services, Sexual Violence Service Programs. We provide 24-hour crisis services, information and referrals, counseling and support to sexual violence survivors and their families. But also in public health, pre prevention is a primary focus of our work. Whether it's educating individuals and their families about sexual violence, raising awareness in the community that unwanted sexual contact is never okay, or building community understanding of the need to start by believing sexual violence um, survivors. This Sunday at Hamlin, Hamlin University, we'll be holding our 10th annual Out of Darkness into Light walk in support of sexual violence survivors and their families. A timely and supportive response to sexual violence survivors at each phase is also vital to prevention. Victims who aren't supported who don't think they will be believed decide, may decide not to report a crime or will not continue with the criminal investigation past the initial report to police. We can prevent more sexual violence. It's very important to keep in mind a few data points noted in this report, and there's just so much detail, so much rich and good detail in this report, so it's hard to highlight just a few, but there's three I would like to highlight. It's already been said, but we, we, sh we shouldn't leave without understanding that the majority of people who have experienced sexual violence do not report the incident. And second, that more than a quarter of survivors who do make an initial report of the crime, tw of, of that number, 26% decline to proceed with the investigation. We should never second guess the survivor's decision, but we need to make sure 
that we remove barriers and provide all the support we can so that individuals will seek prosecution. Finally, the report tells us something um, that, I, that I think we all will find of great concern as well, that almost one quarter of the reported cases involve a victim with a cognitive or a mental health disability. I know we can do better. We all know we can do better. And what we can do is to better support, educate, and change the outcomes for people who have been sexually abused or could be abused in the future. To do so requires us to closely look at what's happening and why it's happening, and for all, all of us, in our multiple roles to work together to respond to sexual violence in our community. Again, I wanna thank County Attorney Choi for, for his leadership in the production of this report. I also would like to thank our County Board Chair, our Ramsey County Board Chair, Jim McDonough, and the entire Ramsey County Board, Commissioner Ortega as well, for your commitment and the resources that in the future, Me Too becomes a less likely phrase. Next, we have Terry McLaughlin. Good morning. Based on the experiences of, of Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault staff and our member programs, as, as they work in the communities across the state, we know that Ramsey County Attorney's Office has established a strong response to sexual violence. We also appreciate the Ramsey County is taking the time to examine its own practices. Never an easy thing to do. Because there's always room for improvement and for growth. It's important that agencies tasked with the justice response to undertake this review and not settle for the status quo. We applaud Ramsey County Attorney John Choi for his leadership and his willingness to provide some information from behind the scenes to help all of us better understand how the response succeeds and where we need more attention, where it needs more attention. We'll all learn from this data, not only as professionals in the field, but also as members of the public. We all share an interest in improving the experience of sexual assault victims, survivors, when they report, we all want to ensure that survivors feel confident in their engagement with law enforcement and prosecution. And we also know that sexual assault remains among the most underreported crimes. So we still have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go in building that trust. This type of transparency helps to shine a light on the process that is, can be intimidating and mysterious to many. We don't wonder why so few, go, few crimes go reported. It can be terribly intimidating and frightening. We all know that when we start by believing, we positively change the experience for victim survivors and increase our possibilities of successful investigation, prosecution, and conviction. What Minkasa has learned from the victims and survivors that we've worked with through the competency project is this. It starts with active listening and showing interest. They need to see this. They need to believe that we believe. This is exactly what Ramsey County has embarked upon. Asking and sincerely hearing about the victim experiences and exploring how we can serve them better. And for that, I'm incredibly proud to be a part of this community. Now we have Commissioner Jim McDonough. The timing of my remarks here are actually pretty good. We're trans transitioning from good morning to good afternoon. <laughs> and this press conference is actually uh, a message to the community that we're transitioning from how we've done business in the past. And the data that we've collected will indicate that we have not served our community in how we've done business in the past. This is not about pointing figures. This is not about finding fault. This is about finding a way to do better. This is about sending a message that Ramsey County is a start by believing county. That all the partners behind you have made a commitment to start by believing. My message is to the victims and survivors that are out there right now, 
and to the victims and survivors that are to come, because today, somewhere in Ramsey County, there will be another victim. There will be another victim, there's no doubt about that. And for us to send a message that we are preparing ourselves to ensure that you have the safest environment to come forward and talk about the most traumatic event that could ever happen to you in your life is a pretty big message we're sending to our community today. I'm proud and honored to stand here with law enforcement, with the county attorney, with the community, with the folks in public health and SOS to be a part of sending that message. We are here for you. We will have advocates that will help you on this journey, that will be there when the investigation starts. We will have trained law enforcement that will understand the trauma that you're going through. To be able to get the evidence to actually move forward with more cases being moved on to the county attorney, with more cases being prosecuted, with more perpetrators being held accountable. The, we live in a culture that in so many ways intentionally and unintentionally supports a culture of rape. We, and, and we've got really good people, right? It's not an intentional thing. But we've, we're working with what we have, what's been built on over the years. And the work that's being presented to the community today is to take that work apart and put that work back together to be more responsive, to be more effective, and to send a, a message that we will hold perpetrators accountable and we will be a community that will support victims so that we can send a message to the community that rape is not acceptable in our community. Sexual violence is not acceptable in our community. Sexual harm is not acceptable in our community. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, all I ask is that you, when I do call on you, just say you know, who you're with, and if there's a specific person you'd like to address it, let us know. Otherwise, we'll leave it open and others can step up to the microphone. So. Let's start with Leah and then we'll go to Mike. Leah Vino from Fox 9, I guess I just want to touch light. Do you know of any other areas around the country, prosecutors that are doing a collaborative effort? Anything like that? Yes, and yes, um, nationally speaking, there have been this type of work funded. In fact, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office uh, twice tried to get funding through the federal government and through other sources, so back in 20. Uh, 12, we submitted a grant request to do exactly this, um, but uh, we were not successful. And in 2015, we applied again, and we were not successful in getting funding to do this type of review. And so, therefore, uh, the light bulb kind of went on in my head and said, well, we have a criminal forfeiture account that could help fund all of this, and so we embarked on a journey two years ago. So there are places around the country that have started looking at their systems, working across disciplines. Uh, the Start by Believing campaign is a national project um, uh, that is like a toolkit for communities to uh, use, and it's been used very differently across America. So this is starting to happen all over the country because the data that we have uh, truly, because I've read so much of the, the, the national work that's been done around some of the research, um, none of this is really surprising to me at all. And it, it shouldn't be surprising to anybody in this community if you've read any of that. One more question if I could. With, I know that a lot of um, sexual assaults have to do with family members. Can you just explain why those weren't included in your study? Mm. Um, Karen, do you want to, can you address that? Yeah. Uh, there were a couple of reasons. When we started looking at this um, issue, John was really interested in the Start by Believing model. And what we see typically or nationally is that when uh, children report family abuse, they don't run into the same disbelief barriers as older uh, teens and adults do who are capable of consent but are reporting non-consent. So we were trying to get out our toughest cases where consent might have happened, but it didn't. So that was the main reason, is we were trying to narrow it down to the non-consenting type of cases. Kevin Feddley, Mental Lawyer. John, um, one of the things that the report highlights is that one of the things you want to change is the uh, 
kind of other metrics other than conviction rate. And the question I have for you is, do you feel that as, as you do the self-examination that your office has been guilty in the past of sort of counting W's and L's rather than looking at the other metrics that you want to focus on at this point? Well, no. I mean, in fact, uh, we don't really underscore the metrics of, con I mean, a conviction rate alone means absolutely nothing. It really doesn't. I mean, it, it's an isolation to other types of information. So as I had talked a little bit about, um, when you look at a charging rate, um, you also have to look at that as uh, at the conviction rate because it's kind of like yin and yang, right? Typically, if you charge more cases and you're aggressive on the charging, your conviction rate might be lower. Or conversely, you might ch charge a very low number of cases and your conviction rate uh, and your jury acquittal rate is going to be, real, you know, in, in the in the very positive area. So it's it's all a, a matter of a number of things. So just justice is not about like it's not a basketball game, right? It's not about trying to score a hundred baskets. Uh, it's about doing the the right thing uh, in these situations, ensuring that we're also. And if anybody out there believes that start by believing is some sort of undermining of due process, uh, it isn't. It's the underpinning of everything that we do. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to the truth. And we're trying to um, ensure that if you're a victim of identity theft or if somebody breaks into my garage, right, the type of approach that the investigator is going to take is going to be similar to that. They're going to walk into the room and never even doubt uh, from the beginning, right, that something happened to you. And then from there, the investigator needs to seek the truth. They need to find the answers. Uh, and then the facts will lead the way uh, as to what that truth is and what uh, the inv investigation will unfold. But oftentimes, if you talk to the victims of sexual assault, oftentimes that interface with law enforcement doesn't always go uh, so well. I think we're doing it really well here in Ramsey County, um, but it's never perfect because it's uh, uh, human beings are involved. So Kevin, I'm not sure that I answered your question uh, perfectly, but is that what you were getting at? Okay. <laughs> uh, Liz from WCCO. I guess, uh, first, Mr. Choi, uh, I'm trying to get a little more clarity. Will it be two more advocates in addition to some, some positions that are already on uh, public? So how many total will there be? Um, I think Ann Barry would be the best person to a answer the question about the total number of advocates and how that would work, because sure. that would be in her department. Sure. So we'll be adding two to a core group of five advocates. Be also, Chief, how many sex crimes investigators total will you then add? Um, yeah, thank you, Liz. It's, uh, right now we're at six investigators. This will increase our strength to eight, which will be a 33% increase from what we had before due to the county funding that we're receiving. Well, I think for, to recognize that um, the, the most important part of all of this is to recognize that moving forward, uh, these things have to change. With respect to moving backwards, the review that we did, uh, the intention, the primary intention was not to look for cases to charge. Uh, it was to better understand why those cases may not have been charged, why some of those cases never were presented to the county attorney's office for review why during the investigation a victim felt like he or she did not want to continue on and also to understand why we were getting some of these convictions and why we were doing so well in front of a jury right and so uh, i guess the message that i would have is that um, moving forward uh, we are going to make the changes that are necessary because we see some of the shortfalls that have been happening in the past. And I think this is something that anybody that has been following uh, and reading about the national data that's out there, uh, it's been out there for a really, really long time. What it, now, what it takes, though, to change all of that is political will and resources. And I think this whole um, review was about kind of creating that path forward so that we have the justification uh, to make these immediate investments. And by the way, 
our work is not going to just stop there. We're going to continue thinking about where more resources are needed. But also, too, uh, this is a, a public endeavor. And so what we need to do is we need to talk directly to the public because the public isn't aware of these things, right? And so what today is all about and why we're speaking out and we're making a stand is that we do want to be held accountable by the public moving forward. And, but we also want the public to be engaged because I think when they learn about this issue, they'll care about this issue. And they're going to want people with disabilities who are being victimized and are being um, sexually assaulted, that we're doing everything that we can to provide them the services that they need, that we have robust investigation, and we're doing everything that we can to hold those perpetrators accountable. Right, Mr. KSTP. Mr. Choi, how would you gauge whether or not these new resources are effective? Are you going to continue to gather this data and uh, continue on with this campaign? Well, like I said in my closing remarks, I mean, we're going to be incredibly transparent about, because uh, today we have a baseline, at least for the past, I mean, from 2016 and the previous four years, we have a baseline of kind of where we're at as a community. And I just want to make it very clear um, that where we're at today, I think compared comparatively from a national perspective, I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, but, we're, but it's not good enough. And we're going to do it better. And so we can look at some of the metrics and things that we have. But again, justice is not a basketball game, OK? And so we can't just take one metric and say that somehow we did a lot better or we didn't do so well. And so it's a combination of number, a number of things. But I think most importantly, and this is the, the part that, the, um, that we're going to be as a part of the leadership uh, equation to stress, is that what this is really about is doing our own best practices, right? And so I think in the context of a, a system that responds to any type of crime or sexual assault, oftentimes the way that we think about things is that we think about what is that person that's after me going to do or think. So as a prosecutor, we spend a lot of time thinking about how is a jury going to be thinking about this case. Now, we have to think about those things from a professional and ethical way. And then an, an investigator is going to be thinking, well, you know, is the county attorney going to charge this case? And then from a standpoint of a victim who presents and says, this happened to me, oftentimes a victim survivor is going to say, are they going to actually believe me? And what will come of me when I come forward? What consequences will I bear? And so what we need to do is I think start thinking about what are those best practices in victim advocacy, right? And they're outlined in this report. And we need to get that victim advocacy up on the front end, connected with police, so they're providing that service. So when we have like 30 days of just silence, somebody is saying, Don't, the silence doesn't mean a bad thing. It doesn't mean that nobody believes you. They're actually waiting for some tests to come back, right? And this is what's going to happen in the process. That can make a world of a difference. And so there's best practices that advocacy can do. There's best practices uh, with respect to investigation. When you, we deal with somebody who has gone through a very, very traumatic event, if you sit down with them and say, tell me what happened, start from the beginning, that's not a very good interview technique. Because when you have had a traumatic event, oftentimes what's going to trigger what how to remember things is not from a chronological perspective. You and I sitting here might look at that's a very logical way to gather the facts, right? Start from the beginning and tell me what happened. But there's information and research out there that suggests that there are better ways to ask those questions, right? And then I also want to make sure that you don't forget this about investigation. It's about the resources. If our investigators feel like they're drinking out of a fire hose every day, you know what they're going to do? They're going to start triaging, and they're going to start thinking about, okay, which cases are like slam dunks, and which cases are going to be like cause me to have to do extraordinarily more work to get to the truth. And then in prosecution, uh, there are best practices that we can uh, employ, and so that's a big part of that to, to determine whether or not we're actually making those changes, and that comes through training, it comes through investments, et cetera. So I hope that answers your question. Report, do they seem as much 
No, not at all. They've been a, a great partner, and um, I just think there, there's, I think the data was relatively a small set of information. Um, so we've collected that information, but I think that information was sent back to the, the police department. But they have been a strong, strong supporter of this. Uh, the chief there is somebody who's very supportive. Kevin, last question. I don't think I've found the end of the weeds. I think this is important, but in the report, it's not really explained why it's significant. There's a, there's a statistic that says that most of the women who report these assaults are not in any observable way injured. That seems important, perhaps it's connected to an assumption of non-belief. Can you explain why that's important? Karen, do you think you can handle that question? Yeah. Are you asking why it was important that we collect the no, information? No, what's significant about that fact that most women uh, are not observably injured? Well, I mean, of course, in any in any prosecution of, of a crime, we're looking for corroboration of the victim's account of the crime, and that, of course, relates to sexual violence as well. So we look at all the factors that might go along to support somebody's um, report of a crime. Um, in, I, I think the public believes that sexual violence often leaves egregious injury. So, uh, but those of us who work in this field and handle these cases know that it does not often lead to that. The other thing too to keep in mind about the data that we collected is these were both penetration and contact offenses. So we, we have cases involved in the study that involved sexual touching that didn't involve penetration too, so. I think it's important to understand most sexual assault is actually perpetrated by somebody the victim knew. It's not, the violent stranger rape is actually a very small part of the numbers. Most sexual part, uh, assault comes from some contact with an individual that they've already come in contact with and that looks a little different than say the vision you have in your head of you know somebody pulled being pulled into an alleyway and violently raped. Well, I know we have probably more questions. There's a lot to cover here, but I want to thank you all so much for taking the time today. And, and Dennis, just one more thing. You know, Scott, you came late. Stand up. I want to also uh, point out, because I got to thank the county manager and our deputy county manager, Scott Williams, um, who really help make this happen. You know, Jim wanted this to happen, I want it to happen, but it doesn't happen unless uh, people like uh, Scott and our county manager, Julie Kleinschmidt, uh, recognize that it's important. So I just wanted to thank you for, for all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We'll just go that way. Good. 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 Good.